All right, family. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shabbat Shalom. Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. As promised, we're gonna um get into another video today, another lesson um regarding the Mandy people. All right, we'll be getting into part two. Um before we get started today, we're gonna give our praises, honor, glory, thanks to our Elohim, to our Father above. All right, for giving us the ability to gather here today to go over this information. All right. So, again, today's video, today's topic of concern, we'll be going over the Mandy people and their Israelite history. Um, today, we'll be showing how they have connections with the um, the Elephantine community, how they migrated from that area, and um, later ended up founding today's um known kingdom of ghana mali and things of that sort all right so again mandy israelite history is what we get into into today and i want to make sure um everybody please just uh make sure you pay attention so you can catch what's going on within the video so you can understand the topic you know and, and um if you have any questions or anything please um drop them in a in a chat any concerns Drop them in the chat and I'll do my best to answer them. All right. Happy Shabbat to everybody. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. And again, please make sure you like the video, share it if you want. And we're about to go ahead and get started. All right. So we see uh, we're going to start with a migration of Israelites going into Sonin or Aswan. And eventually going over to Western Africa, places like Mauritania, Ouagadou, uh, Mali. All right. So let's get to it. Let's get to it. We're going to start off. We move this. We're going to start off in the book, Ark of God. All right. And just get a quick reference for understanding. All right. So the Jewish Egyptians had a community on the Elephantine Island at the major Nile city of Aswan in southern Egypt, all right? So it was a major um, Jewish um, village or island or community rather within Egypt on the Elephantine Island, specifically in Aswan or Sonin, all right? So keep that in mind. It was Jews in Aswan and Sonin, Elephantine. But if we continue reading, it uh, mentions a migration of Egyptian Jews or Jews into Ethiopia. And um, we know that would be your Beta Israel or your Falashas. And it says the Egyptians had supported Cleopatra in um, her war against Augustus Caesar. But when she was defeated, it became dangerous for these Jews to remain in Egypt. They are said to have migrated to Ethiopia, Ethiopia via Nubia starting around 39 B.C. And again, we're saying or I'm saying or what I'm about to show is that it was another migration of these Egyptian Jews or these Elephantine Jews into Western Africa. All right. So let's get to it. Before we get to it, we need to get a brief view of who was in Elephantine, what tribes, what kingdom, southern or northern kingdom, or was it both? All right. So um, source we're going to be reading from is Anayahu, some other deities, and the Jews of Elephantine. All right. So we're going to start at the very top of the highlight. It says, in more than one respect, the situation in 7th century Israel contains the seeds of the religious pluralism in which Aramaic documents from Elephantine bear witness, all right? The population of northern Israel was diversified, consisting of primarily of Israelites and Armenians. It also included Babylonians and Arab elements, all right? The situation, uh, moving down to the second highlight, the situation just described for northern Israel after 700 BCE contains many elements which reoccur at 5th century BCE, Elephantine and Sonin or Sonin. All right. So remember this, uh, what it just said, these northern kingdom Israelites reflect events that happened or recurred in Elephantine. The colonies are populated by Jews and Armenians who use Aramaic for their written communications. All right. So these Jews that were in Elephantine were actually northern kingdom Israelites. It says, top of the highlight, the history of Jewish migration into Egypt is likely to have been complex and modern reconstruction can hardly be more than um, an informed guess. 
The obscurity of the historical evidence, however, should be a reason to refrain from general hypotheses. However, excuse me, uh, let me see, I missed my start. Okay, general hypotheses, both the background of Anat Yahu, right, which was a Nordic kingdom deity, and the entire picture of the religious life at Elephantine and Sanin strongly suggest that the, histor the historical core of the community came from the northern Israel. All right, so the, the Jews of Sanin, more uh, majority of that community was northern kingdom Israelites. All right, and this is why we see the Falasha claiming the tribe of Dan and actually branching off from these Elephantine Jews. All right. So again, we're going to show a migration of Elephantine Jews into Western Africa. We already know about the Elephantine Jews that went into Ethiopia and became the um, Falashas. All right. Second highlighted. All right. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom to everybody in the chat. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome, welcome. But second highlighted, it says, the fact that the religious practices in the Elephantine colony have a northern Israelite background means that the Jewish segment of the population is chronologically secondary. The Jewish um, character of the Elephantine colony is probably based on an important influx of Judites who joined the Israelite settlers. All right, so you even had tribes of Judah come in later and join the northern kingdom Israelites that was already in Egypt, Elephantine. All right, so it said it's much, it continues on to say it must be um, kept in mind, moreover that the immigrants from northern Israel would have entered into Egypt by way of Judah, all right? So the northern kingdom Israelites entered in Egypt by way of Judah. It may be surmised that many of them had not um, intended to prolong their wanderings all the way into Egypt. At any event, some of them stayed in Judah for a significant length of time, all right? So why is this important, all right? Why is this important? We see northern kingdom Israelites in um, Elephantine, we see um, Southern Kingdom Israelites in Elephantine, specifically in Aswan and Sunin. This is important because um, when we look at this book, Encyclopedia of African American History, it tells us that Ghana, or as it's, or as it was called by its inhabitants, Wagadu or Wagadu, was founded around 100 CE by the Soniki, all right? who, according to their tradition, migrated from the city of Sonin or Aswan in Upper Egypt to the region of southeastern Mauritania. All right. So according to the Sonikis or traditions or the Mandi or tradition, they migrated from Sonin and Aswan, which is the Elephantine Jewish community. If you take it a step back further in their or traditions, they'll tell you they came from actually Israel into Aswan and then into Western Africa. Another source right here tells us um, something similar and give us a more precise date for understanding. So the African or the Africa fact book, all right, busting the myth, source to the left, is dealing with migrations into um, Western Africa or um, Egypt, rather. It says the first migration might have occurred as a result of the Assyrian invasion of ancient Egyptians and the defeat of the Kushite king of the 25th dynasty in 660 um, B.C. The traditions of the Soniki, founders of Ghana Empire, right, founded around 250 uh, to uh, 170 AD or 1007 AD. From these ashes arose the Mali and Songhai empires as well at different times, asserts that their remote founding ancestors was born in the region of Sona or Aswan, all right, in Upper Egypt, all right, this would be the Elephantine Jewish community. He brought with him two zoomophobic divinities, the serpent, all right, keep that in mind, the serpent and the vulture, the ancient Egyptian um, symbol of the royal and um, over upper and lower Egypt, the water dwelling or the water dwelling serpent, Beta, came the, became the nation deity of Wagadu, capital of the Ghana Empire, all right? And we're going to get into uh, that water dwelling serpent or this snake amongst these Israelites later. <laughs> but continuing down to the next highlighted section. It says, um, let me zoom in. It says, Bukhar Lam situates the departure of the Sunniki's ancestors from Egypt no later than 486 BC as a result of the exactions of the Persian king Darius on the inhabitants on the Nile Valley. All right, so these Sunniki, 
these Mandy people actually left Elephantine, all right, actually left the Elephantine Jewish community around 486 BC or no later than 486 BC, all right, because they were being taxed or exacted by the Persian king Darius, all right? And we know the Israelites had many encounters with this king. But it goes on to say the foundations of the society and the state that will later become the empire of Ghana will have occurred no later than 460 BCE, all right? So these people got into Western Africa around 400 BCE, but we see the kingdom of Ghana didn't, um, or the kingdom of Wagadu rather, didn't come into flourishment or to really didn't become founded until later, all right? Two years later. But again, that's important because again, these Soniki would have been coming from that Ilifatan community, Sonin or Aswan. Continuing on, the world's first um, true black history, all right? The world's first true black history. It tells us at the very top, Jewish tribal groups in Senegal are the descendants of the tribe of Dan, all right? Where did they get that from? We're going to continue to read uh, after that highlighted part. It says the Egyptian Jews can be traced, or excuse me, the Egyptian Jews can definitely trace their ancestry to the tribe of Dan. It goes on to say the trans migrants established communities in renowned places as Gao and Timbuktu. So you also had Ethiopian or rather um, Elephantine Jews go into Ethiopia and became the Philosopher Jews or the Beta Israel or the Ethiopian Jews. And you also had Jews from Elephantine going to Western Africa and they became known as your Mandi people or your Bani Israel or your Soniki or your Bafor. All right. But let's continue to break this down. Um, second highlighted. Um, it says Ghana was a Hebrew nation which followed the laws of Moses. The people of Ghana traced their roots to Jews of the first diaspora of 600 BCE. All right. And that's also um, a gem as well, because we just read that the Elephantine Jews came into Egypt after that um, Assyrian conquest. All right. So it says the Ghanaians possessed the Torah, which was compiled before the diaspora, but not the Talmud, which was compiled in Jerusalem and Babylon much later during the early centuries of the Christian era. All right. So these people of Ghana, these founding lineages of Ghana, um, the Mandi people would have been coming from this Elephantine Jewish community in Aswan, Egypt. All right. So let's get into this book, Empires of Medieval West Africa. Mid hour um, empires of medieval West Africa, all right. Okay, so we're going to start at the first highlighted section, just get some brief information before we dig into this book a little bit. So it says the dominant people of um, ancient Ghana were the Suniki people, they were the most northern of the Mandi people, all right. So remember, the Suniki people and the Mandi people, they, they the same, all right. They the Suniki are a Mandi people, rather. All right. And they were called their um, area Wagadu. All right. Third highlighted part it says that these early farmers were among the first to take advantage of ironworking technology that developed in West Africa about 500 um, BCE to 400 BCE. All right. So, again, the development of iron technology in that location also matches the time they would have been coming into Western Africa. And again, the, the um, fourth highlighted. The early Saniki superior iron weapons and horses made it possible for them to establish a kingdom. So let's get into it. So visitors from Northern Africa began referring to the Suniki state as Ghana, but them, the Suniki themselves and other Mandi peoples know the ancient kingdom as Wagadu. All right. So second highlighted. It says the Suniki people's idea about their history are expressed in the legend of Wagadu. This is an oral tradition told by many generations of Jezari. Details vary from one version to the next, but the legend generally describes the origins and the um, early deeds of different Saniki clans. So we're about to get into it. Um, the legend often begins by describing how the ancestors Dinga came somewhere or came from somewhere in the Middle East. Some say he stayed for a time at Jenny, an ancient city that still exists on the Niger north of Bamako, the capital of modern um, Mali, 
Dinger later moved to the town of Dia um, on the island of Delta on the Niger. There he married and had two sons, and they became the Soniki ancestors in the other town of the Sahel. Dinger's movements from place to place are the storyteller's way of explaining the presence of Soniki populations in various parts of the Sahel. Dinga is said to have eventually arrived at a place southwest of Nioro in today's Mali. When he arrived there, it was um, dominated by genies and spirits of a bush. All right, various um, versions of the legend describe a kind of magician's duel that took place between Dinga and the genies. Dinga won the contest and married three daughters and a chief genie. Their sons became the ancestors of many Suniki clans. One clan is Kissy. It was the Kissy that became the ruling clan of Wagadu. And also, family, we got to um, understand that in some of our old traditions, there is going to be things added on, like mythical events and things like that. Um, even um, in the Igbos, uh, some of the Igbo tribes or traditions, they say Eerie, you know, fell out of the sky in, God, um, in um, Igbo land, all right? And others say he migrated from Israel. So we just got to understand the, the uh, mystical things in some of these um, legends and, um, you know, understand what it's actually saying. But again, second um, highlighted section, it says, according to one version of the story, after Dinga died, um, Daiba Kissy had to run away from his angry older brother. He hid in the wilderness. One day, a mysterious drum fell out of a tree and landed at his feet. All right. I'm going to go down to the um, second highlight. It says when Dia Bakissi arrived at the site where the town of Kumbi Sahil was to be established, he founded it and was and it was guarded by a giant snake named Beta. All right. And I, while we reading over this, I want you all to think, um, can we see any um, examples of Israelites um, messing with serpents or snakes or dealing with that type of thing within the scripture? And what tribe? All right, but we're going to read from the, the first highlighted part all the way through. All right. But again, when the, um, the Ibakisi arrived at the site where the town of Kumbi Sahil was to be established, he found it with a, he found it, it was guarded by a giant snake named Deba. In several versions of the legend, um, Dida is said to have lived in either a well or a cave. The giant snake is usually thought of as a python. A python is a snake that often lives in the streams or rivers, so having beta take this form suggests a new settlement was located near water. All right, Diba or Diba Kissy entered into an agreement with the snake beta. They agreed that Diba Kissy would um, could settle there and beta would remain the guardian um, of the place, all right? They also made a deal that every year the great snake would be given the most beautiful young virgin. In return, Beta um, would guarantee that plenty of rain would fall on the region and that there would be lots of gold. All right. The new kingdom was called Wagadu and its capital was called Kumbi Sahil. It prospered under the rule of the Abikisi and his descendants who were known by the title of Magan. All right. Oh, Magan. And that's very interesting because Magan is a Hebrew word and we can find that in um, the scriptures. And I for, actually forgot to incorporate something that's within this. Let me stop this so I can. Let me pause this real quick so I can find something before we continue. Sorry about that, fam. Hope everyone's enjoying the Shabbat today. All right. Hope you all are enjoying the video as well thus far. All right. So. All right. So we can get back to it now. But again, we're going to go back. But again, we can see that. Um. They were known by the title of Magan, and Magan actually means like deliverer or to deliver, all right? And we see it's actually more word for word, but it goes on to say the descendants of the Ibe Kise and, their, and the descendants of the four Fado 
or commanders of the provinces were recognized as the Archocrats clan, all right, of the Saniki. The Archocrats clan were collectively called Wago. The term and the name of the kingdom, Wagadu, are probably related to Wagu, is a contra uh, contraction of Wagadu, all right? And we also see something very interesting as well, because if we look at the Strong's word for Gideon, or the word for Gideon in Hebrew and go to its transliterated forms. We can see over here in the highlighted part I got under it, we have Wigadon, Wigadon, and Wigadon. And even if we go to the root word that Gideon is sprung from right under it, Gada, we actually can see Wagadu within the tr different transliteration forms. We see Wagada, uh, Wagadi, Wagadada, um, Wagadiu. All right. So we see um how this can be a transliteration of either Gideon Gada or even a Hebrew word Gugada. All right. It's a word, it's a Hebrew word named Gugada that has um a same transliteration form as this as well. So again, we see um Wagadu is actually a Hebrew word taken from either Gideon or Gada. And we see the title of these peoples um is Mega, which is a Hebrew word for deliverer. But second paragraph or third paragraph, rather, it says once a year, representatives of the four provinces of Wagadu would assemble at Kumbi Sahil to participate in the virgin sacrifice to Beta, the guardian serpent. This ceremony was an annual renewal of the agreement between the Abakise and Beta, according to some versions of the legend. Each year, um, a different province was required to supply a virgin for the sacrifice. If this was Actually, the practice, it was a custom that probably helped promote unity in the kingdom. After an unspecified number of generations passed, a year arrived when the virgin to be sacrificed happened to be the girlfriend of a young archocrat man. When a girl was about to be given to be, the young man leaped forward with his sword and cut off the snake's head. All right. As Beta's head flew up into the sky, it was pronounced a terrible curse from that um time on. No rain would fall on Wagadu, and no more gold would be um, found there, all right? So a man actually ended up killing this serpent or killing this snake, and from that point on, it, it was the fall of Wagadu, all right? Um, no more gold, no more rain in that um, location, and the kingdom began to crumble. So we can actually say, the, um, you know, the, the reason the empire of Ghana fell was because of idol worship. All right, but we're going to continue to dig into this and show why I say this. So we see they were supposed to sacrifice um, a young girl to a, to a serpent, but it didn't happen because a, a, a young man actually intervened and stopped it. All right, and we can also see an example of that within scripture. But, <clears throat> excuse me, without rain and gold, Wagadu declined and fell into ruin. The Suniki people moved away and countryside became a desert. Some versions of the legend have a final episode that is probably meant to explain how the Suniki people ended up in other places. It is said that the people of Wagadu were enraged that the young man killed Beda, the guardian of the kingdom. He was not a hero, but rather a villain of the story. The snake killer had to flee for his life on a fast horse. One of his relatives who had also a strong horse was told to lead the chase, but he refused to harm his young relatives. All right. So the man ended up going to his mother's house to hide in the south. All right. Or it says the young man hid in the town to the south at the home of his mother. All right. Now let's continue on. Now we turn to Second Kings chapter 18. We're going to start at verse one. and We're going to read something very interesting. All right, and it's going to be very similar to what this young man just did within Wagadu. So 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Eli, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother name was also Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed from the high, excuse me, he removed the high places and break the images and cut down the grooves and break into pieces the brass and serpent that Moses had made. All right. So that brass and serpent that Moses had made made it all the way back to the land of Israel. And we see that it's being uh, broken into pieces. 
For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and called its name Nethuselah. But in the Suniki and the Mandi case, they called the serpent Beta. This is the same situation. Verse 5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any um that were before him. For he clave to the Lord and departed not from the following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. All right. Something also interesting to take um, a look at is the evolution of the God illusion. All right. This book, a science explanation of the origin of nature of God, Yahweh and um, Judaism. But it says the tribe of Dan has the serpent and the chooselet or the, bra the brazen serpent of the book of Exodus as its tribal God. So we see the tribe of Dan actually took this um, serpent on and started incorporating it to their worship. All right. As we see with the um, Mandy people. But again, um, where was I just at? The serpent was later crafted as the rod of Moses and placed in the temple of Solomon for people to worship. Though Moses forbade the making of graven images, he himself made a brass and serpent for the Israelites that look upon to be healed. All right. And the interesting thing is we also have many tribes that, you know, say they're from the tribe of Dan. Like, yeah, we're from the tribe of Dan. We're Danites. And we're going to view that. So, again, this is just connecting, um, I guess you can say, paganism to the tribe of Dan. All right. Um, basically, um, we can say descendants of Dan brought... Serpent worship from Israel into Elephantine, into um, into Western Africa, Wagadu, and things like that sort. But again, we saw the the, the fall of Ghana or Wagadu was because of a serpent. And again, another source we can read, Understanding Dan, just to um, show the, the, the relevance to Dan and the serpent and the credence. Second Kings 18 implies that this uh, serpent figure, Nehusa's time had been an object of worship in the Jerusalem temple for some time. The possibility must be entertained that Nehusa's time was only recent, erected in the temple in Jerusalem, having perhaps been brought in from northern Israelite shrine cult center after the collapse of the northern kingdom in 722 BCE. All right. And they would have brought this into Africa. All right. That's why we have to know the traditions of our people, um, good and bad. It is conceivable that a northern tradition in which the character of Moses figured prominently and with whom the serpent is associated has some measure of positive evaluation for this creature and so use this figure metaphorically as a reference to the northern tribe of Dan. All right. That's why the scripture says um, Dan shall be a serpent. All right. So. We can see the serpent amongst Israel once more. Um, Numbers 21, verse 5, and the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there water. And our soul loafeth this sight bread, or excuse me, loafeth like bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And much people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpent from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it up on a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bit of, when he looketh upon it, shall live. All right. And Moses made a serpent of brass. And put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man when he had beheld the serpent of brass, he liveth. All right. And the children of Israel set forth and pitched into Obal. And again, we see this serpent later making its way into Israel by way of the tribes of Dan or the northern kingdoms, and then back into Africa by way of the northern kingdom. So we can look at some more examples of the Mandy people um, associated with this um, serpent coat thing real quick, just to, you know, solidify that connection with the Mandy people and the tribe of Dan. All right. And this is coming from the Mandy blacksmith for knowledge, power, art in West Africa. We're going to start at the very top. It says another deviation technique involved the use of snakes. Master of this method are be, uh, believed to have the power to call serpents to them um, from the bush. 
Second highlight, it says the Mandy author, Kamara Lai, provides an eyewitness account to or of this deviation method. He notes that it was practiced to great advantage by his father, who was a famous Monica Smith in the Republic of Guinea. All right, a key to his success involved a relationship he maintained with a small snake, which Kamara would see from time to time leaving his father's compound. The snake helped um, the metalsmith know and advantage what sorts of clients or work his clients would be bringing them. A very famous Mandy Smith also intervened with snakes. By the time he died in the late 1970s, Sagnity Samuguru had become one of the most powerful smiths in Mali. His name, Sagati, means master of snakes, all right? And he is said to have been capable of calling them to him and communicating with them whenever he liked, all right? And again, this is just to show that Mandy connection um, with the tribe of Dan by way of the serpent worship, right? By way of Nathusala or Beta. And I'm going to continue on to the next source. And again, this is coming from Kalanu, and it tells us that, yet yeah, indeed, there are a number of historical records of small Jewish kingdoms and tribal groups known as Bani Israel that were part of the Wolof and Mandi communities. These existed in Senegal from the early Middle Ages up to the 18th century. When they were forced to convert to Islam, some of these claim to be descendants of the tribe of Dan. All right, some of these claim to be descendants of the tribe of Dan. All right. It says the traditional tribe of the Jewish gold and metal attritions who were also said to have built the golden calf. All right. So that's very interesting. So, again, we just made that connection. We even have, um, again, um, people from the Mandy tribes and things like that who will tell you they descend from the tribe of Dan. As we just saw, some of these um, tribes claim to be descendants of the tribe of Dan. And again, it's also showing that this could be very true as well, because, again, the Saniki and Mandy, they did come from Elephantine, as well as the Ethiopian Jews, who are um, the tribe of Dan also. But continue. Now we're about to get into a fall of Ghana by way of um, Islam the conversion, and the diaspora of the Mandy people from this point on, all right? And first book we'll be reading from is Timbuktu and the Songhai Empire, all right? Timbuktu and the Songhai Empire, um, 22 Israelite kings before Islam. And it says, the first rulers to establish a state there was Kwa Yamaga, all right? Kwa Mamaga. The um, seat of his sovereignty being Ghana, a large city in the land of Bagana. It is said that the state was founded before the Prophet Muhammad's mission, and 22 kings ruled before that event. And 22 after, making a total of 44 in all, they were Bidan in origin, all right, which could mean um, foreign or in some instances white, all right. So they were foreign in origin. And remember, um, Magan or Magan, that means deliverer, all right? And that was the uh, actually the title of the first ruler that established. It was Kaya um, Maga or Kaya Maga in different forms. <laughs> Again, going back to this book, The um, World's True Black History, first edition. It tells us that, um, what should we start? We're going to start at the very top, actually. Let's start at the very top. It says in the 7th century AD, the whole of Africa north of the Sahara Desert was conquered by the armies of Islam. Then an extremely um, lucrative trade system developed with the Sub-Saharan Kingdom of Ghana. The commodities first traded were salt and um, were gold and salt. This made regular caravan routes across the, the uh, Sahara Desert to various cities in Ghana. These cities became very wealthy. Not long after the year 100 or 1000 AD, the king of Ghana converted to Islam, all right? So the kings of Is, um, Ghana converted to Islam. Um, it was the it was mainly for getting trade with the powerful Muslim states of North Africa and had little to do with faith, it was said, all right? Again, another source, Introduction to the History of Africa Civilization. It tells us that the name 
Ghana is said to be derived from the title of the kings who also had an alternative the title, the Kaya Maga, or the king of gold, all right? Maga is the title for the ruler, among other many groups like the uh, the De Alonki, the De Lanki, and also the Soso of the Upper Guinea in um 1000 in um excuse me in the all right i'm sorry family i was looking at something else but again in 10 in the 1060s the magan's name was tenamakami all right so remember that name because this is actually the last king <clears throat> this is actually the last um hebrew king that converted before um islam so in the 1060s the Magan's name was Tenamaniki. All right, source to the left, the 11th Templar. It tells us that a few years ago, however, in 1076, Ghana was invaded by the Muslim troops of Abu Bakr, and its Jewish king, Tenamikini, had to convert to Islam in order to remain in power. All right, so he had to convert to Islam to convert um, to remain in power. So they were Jewish in origin and Jewish in origin or Hebrew in origin, but Muslim in faith out to this point. And it goes on to say it is said that other tribes may be or may possibly also be Jewish, but have now been colonized by Islam, the Bani Israel and the Balfour. All right, we know the Bani Israel is um, the, the Mandinki tribes or the Mandinka tribes or the Mandi tribes and also the Balfour is a Mandy tribe that's, that lives in Western uh, Mauritania. So Mandy groups converted, again, Timbuktu and Songhai Empire. The Mandy groups in the area consisted of the Suniki, the Maliki, the Bambara, the Dula. All right, the rulers of ancient Ghana were the Suniki, and certain Suniki clans were among the earliest peoples in West Africa to have converted to Islam. Following contact with the Berber and Arab traders from North Africa, doing business with them in the ancient territories of Ghana. Again, so these are some of the tribes that were forced to convert after that last king, um, the Bambara, Suniki, Maliki, um, the Dula, even the Soso, your Bafour. All right, so we're going to get a brief history of the Bissa. All right. Quick history of the Bissa, and you can find this source at the um, Zago Republic. So it tells us that the ancient name for the Bissa, according to research, was actually Soniki. All right, so they come from the Soniki people. This is a Mandi group, all right, with their ancestors called Dinga, who came from the Middle East, according to some Islam, um, excuse me, Islamic narrations. It is said that Dinga came from a town called Aswan in Egypt, all right? And we know that Aswan was Elephantine, the Elephantine Jewish community. They further moved to the synagogue in Sigamis after the Ghana Empire got collapsed. Some of the Sigamis are as follows, the Bambara, the Malike, the Marka, the Wangara, the Samo, as well as the Dogon. From Senegal, a segment of the group known as the Mandinka ethnic group moved to the Mandi which is now known as Mali to form the Mali Empire, all right? So we're just getting some of the tribes that came out of the, the kingdom of Ghana. Um, out there was sacked and out there failed and out there they converted, all right? So let's get into um, one of those peoples. And one of those peoples are the Bambara, of course. We're going to get a source real quick from the Jewish um, Herald. Record of Christian effort. We're going to get some of their old traditions on um, how they say they got it to Western Africa. And this is coming um, from the source to the left again. And it says a Jew who had accompanied a German traveler as far as Timbuktu found in the, bomb the boundary of the kingdom of Bombaria. A large number of Jewish Negroes, nearly every family among them possessed a law of Moses written upon parchment. Although they speak of the prophets, um, they have not their writings. Their prayers differ from those of other Jews and are committed to little leaves of parchment. He goes on to say stitched together and containing numerous passages derived from Psalms. These Jews have mingled some of the super superstitions of oral law with those of the neighbors, um, the Mohammedans and the heathen. Um, and the last highlighted, it says the explanation of which they give themselves in connection with their black skin is that 
after the destruction of Jerusalem at the time of the first captivity. All right. We know the first captivity was the Assyrian captivity. Some of their ancestors um, having neither goods nor land fled into the desert. All right. They fled into the desert. So let's continue to piggyback off that source. And to do that, we're going to go to Bambara, a Proto-Hebrew language. All right. By Joseph um, Edinburgh. All right. Bambara, a Proto-Hebrew language. And we're going to start with the highlighted, of course. It says, thus, for example, while studying West African Babara language, the author discovered a strange affinity between Babara, monosyllabolic, and Hebrew philosyllabotic words, all right? And it goes on to say, Babara could be considered a proto-Hebrew language, all right? Continuing, it says, Babara and Hebrew tribes had been separated several millennia ago and that the language of each group of tribes continue to develop according to the changing conditions of their respective environments, all right? So we see according to this author, it is proposed that the Bambara language is uh, fairly in, uh, fairly similar to the Hebrew. And he also states that they have been separated from the Israelites for a while and that their language just, you know, continue to develop depending on um, the environments they were in and the conditions. But even with, within this book, he has a few, a lot of pages um, showing the similarities between the two languages. And even right over here to the right, we have a chart from the book showing the different um, comparisons with the Hebrew words um, on the left side and the bit, excuse me, the, the existing names in the, in the, um, Western Africa on the left side and the biblical names on the right side. And even if we go over to um, number 15, we see Wagadu and Gugada. All right. As I was saying later, because Gugata is also a Hebrew word that could be um, attested to Wagadu. So, again, the Barbara and Hebrew tribes have been separated from several millennials. All right. And it's also worthy to note that some of these Bambaras, um Jewish Negroes were sent into the Americas. And this is a quote from newspapers.com. It says, Jewish Negroes near the Bambara, the boundaries of Bambara entered into Mali. It makes sense being that so many people are saying it, that Bambara were brought to South Carolina, Georgia, and the French colonies in large numbers. All right. They were brought there in large numbers, these Jews. And if you may map out the areas, you will see that every black art from and, um, and the one black church that is still essential essentially African was packed with nothing but Bambara, Tureg, and Fulani people. This article is from 1853. Continuing. So we talked about the bards a little bit yesterday. Now we're going to continue to expound on them because this is a, like a, a caste system or a certain class amongst these Mandy peoples, a certain rank. All right. And we're going to start off with the source we used yesterday. Storytellers of synagogue, catered reclusive Jewish community, start at the very top. In the 15th century, the Portuguese began to sail south along the West African coast, searching for the sea route to India. Along the way, they landed in all sorts of places along the coast where they traded with natives and documented everything they saw. One of these documents written by an anonymous Portuguese um, navigator provides us with a rare glimpse into a very strange phenomenon. A group of Jews who lived in West Africa near the Gambia River. Some of the people here believed in Muhammad, but the majority are idol worshippers. Um, wrote the nameless Portuguese navigator. In this land, there are Jews known as Gauls, all right, who are Mandi, and they are black like the rest of the inhabitants, but they have no synagogues and do not conduct Jewish ceremonies. Many societies in West Africa have wandering storytellers known as the Griots, the Jelly, the Jolly, the Jaw, and the Jula. It seems that these are the same Gauls, all right? These are the same people that the Portuguese navigators saw. Continuing. Pound Salute, the West African voice of the Gri or the Griezer in the Pisan Cantos, all right? It says, in the country and in Mandingo, there are Jews who are called Gualin, all right? They are black like the other people of the country. They do not live with the other blacks. They live um, by themselves in their own places. These gods are often buffoons and play the violin or the viol in the cavalcas 
string instruments and our singers, all right? And it goes on to say, and when the noble people or when the nobles leaves his house, the Jews go out ahead of him and sing and shout their buffooneries or their song, all right? And these, um, to pitch to the right is a Mandinka or a Mandy Gall or a Bard or a Griot. Again, one more source, um, the development of caste system in Western Africa. It says for Fernandez refers to both the Wolof and the Mandy Bars as Jews, since he, like most of the 16th and 17th century writers, believed the social segregation to which the Bars were subject could only be due to Jewish ancestry. All right. Second highlighted, according to him, among both the Mandy and Wolof, blacksmith, leather workers, and weavers, as well as bars, were subject to severe um, segregation, social segregation. He states that these persons whom he referred to as Jews were, were never allowed to enter the homes of the well-born nor marry their women. All right. And, and again, this is amongst the Mandy people. All right. Or rather, these are Mandy peoples. So we looked at the um, the Gaul um, class or the, the musical class system or caste system amongst the Mandy. Now we're going to look at the... Um, the Mandy traditional blacksmith caste, all right, because um, they're known as being of Israelite origin as well. So um, I'm going to go ahead to the next slide and getting this source from Judaic Threads and West African Tapestry, No More Forever, all right. Look at, get a, um, excuse me, get a sip of water real quick. All right. Answer some questions in the um, chat real quick. Is it true all Bantus come from Nigeria or they came directly from Egypt slash Sudan? Um, we already did a video on this, but a lot of the Bantus migrated from um, Israel and Egypt. They went into Western Africa first before spreading out into Central Africa. All right, so a lot of them went into um, Noak. A lot of them went into Ebo land. And then they went into um, Central Africa from there. And we, we brought this out already. If you can go back and um, watch some of those videos. Um, I believe one of them was called um, Material Culture. Material Culture. Also, it's in um, The Legends of the Lost Tribe. And yeah, shalom, shalom, shalom to everybody in the chat. Shalom. All right, so let's continue. Again, Judaic threads in West African tapestry no more forever. We're about to get into the blacksmith class amongst the Mandy people. All right, so Malam or variants of it in both Hebrew and Arabic um, typology and usages and honorific designation, not only a political elite, but also a scholar, a literate person, and a fine craftsperson, the master of a craft, or the head of a workshop. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the term Malam is used notably by the Tarek Smiths and throughout modern, or excuse me, northern Nigeria by the Hussan or the Hassan builders, and borderers and weavers, as well as by a host of dignitaries. Malumin, an obvious variant, is used by the metal smith attached to the nomadic clans and lineages that transverse Mauritania. Their leather working wives addressed as Malima, according to oral tradition, their heritage is, is associated with the historical obscure um enigmatic Balfour, right? So these Malam, Malamin, and Malama, they are Balfour Mandi people or Mandi people. The Malams descend from the Balfour. It is they who taught the autochthonous Berbers ironworking, all right? So they taught the Berbers how to do ironworking. They were Jews of race, all right? They were Jews of race. The Malams make and always have made the works of art. One calls them Yahoos because after legend, only the Jews in Mauritania were the artisans, all right? Only the Jews in Mauritania were the artisans or the blacksmiths. Scholars have addressed the Imatic Balfour tribute um, their presence in the Adar area of Mauritania to migration from the city of Sigili or Sigili Masa, 
all right, Sajili Massa in southern or southeastern Morocco. The regions of the, the Jebel, Nasufa, or Nafusa in Tunisia and the Mozab of Algeria. Each of these areas inhabited by a large coexisting assembly of Ibadite, all right, um, that's a type of um, Islamic community, as well as Jewish traders who maintained intense commercial relation across the Sahara, as well as by a concentration of Jewish artisans under the Puritanical, excuse me, Puritanical, Puritanical, all right, under the Puritanical Ibadite protection, all in need of skills considered veal and incompatible with Islamic traditions, such as tanning, dyeing gold, and ironworking, all right? So or tradition credits the Bafour with the founding the city of Albudan or Aldan in the Adar region, all right? Aldan in the Adar region, all right? So they founded that, but it goes on to say that the Sen Senegalese traditions recorded early in the last century also claimed that the CB Bafour were Jews initially forced to south or to migrate south by the Almoravs in the 11th century and further south by the Hisani in the 16th century who settled among the wolf populations where they are still designated as CB by four. Next highlighted, it says other accounts credited the by four with the introduction of irrigation and the construction of the stone line wells with intensive subterranean galleries, building technologies involved in masonry, carpentry, and metalworking skills, all attributed to the Bani Israel. And again, another another way we can connect these people or the Soniki and the Mandi and the Bafour to, you know, the Elephantine Jews is because we see that the um the, the Jews that migrated into Ethiopia, they called themselves Beta Israel. You know, they called themselves Beta Israel. But the Jews that migrated to West Africa, they called themselves Bani Israel. All right. The Bani Israel of Ghana and Timbuktu and Mali. It was no other than the Suniki people in the in the Bafour. It goes on to say some decades ago in a discussion of artisanal caste in Western Sahara, Julio Cario noted that the Malimin, a low despised metalworking caste, are equally called Majorios. And traditions accord them an Israelite origin, all right? So we see the people um, of the blacksmith class, the Malin, the blacksmiths, are known to have Israelite origins. Continuing. Until recently, the pieces of jewelry most favored by Jewish women throughout North Africa was the triangular fibula created by metal um, colossally soldier or so on um, solidarity minute rings together in a figure green derived technology often with attached triangular wings all right skip down to the next highlight it says sometimes described with a seal of solomon sometimes with hebrew arabic or judeo arabic script often framing floral motifs that came uniquely from the hand of jewish malams all right in the traditional Jewish jewelry centers of southwestern Morocco, in the Jebel, Amor, Amor, in Algeria, both regions of reputed Bafour origin. So we see once again these Bafours being attributed to, um, um, I guess you could say, um, metalworking or a blacksmith cast. And we see that their women actually made Jewish jewelry. And again, the by four go back to the Mandy people. And to the right, we see um, the pictures of the Jewish, the jury or the Jewish jury that these um, alums were making, these um, these Mandy women were making. And this is in from um, Morocco. Again, it's very interesting. We actually have um, evidence of our people making um, Israelite jury or Jewish jury. And again, I'm going to read this again because it's important. It says sometimes inscribed with a seal of Solomon, sometimes with Hebrew, Arabic, or Judeo-Arabic script, often um, framing floor motives. They came uniquely from the hands of the Jewish Malams. All right? We just read that the Malams were the blacksmiths who were the Bafour. All right? In a traditional Jewish jewelry center of southwestern Morocco. 
All right. And these people are reputed to be of Bafor origin. That's very, that's very good. That's very interesting. So again, we're going to continue to look at the blacksmith cast amongst these people. We're going to go back to the book Empires of West, uh, Empires of Medieval West Africa, rather. And we're going to start the highlighted section. It says the, the traditional priests of the Suniki and other Mendi peoples have usually been blacksmiths because they knew the secrets of how to use fire to turn raw iron ore into tools and weapons essential for daily life, a process associated with magic. So again, this says again right here again that the Mandi and the Soniki, um, they were usually the blacksmiths because it was only they who knew the secrets of how to make it. They knew how to um, turn a raw iron tool and ore and things like that. And they said they had the essential information to um, make this, all right? It says it was through their perceived special abilities to communicate with spirits or with the spirit world that the traditional priests became guardians of the sacred groove, groove and religious objects stored there, all right? So again, we see the Suniki um, is responsible or are known as blacksmiths. And we know they are Israelites. And we just saw the Balfour um, who taught the Berbers iron working. And they go back to the Mandy and they are Israelites as well. All right, before I continue, let me check the chat section real quick. And if you have any questions, so go ahead and uh, put it in the uh, comment section before we get it ready and wrap this up. One second, family. All right. So Black Jews of Africa. And I um, really advise or recommend this book um, for a lot of our people out there. You want to um, learn a, a little more history about Black Jews in Africa. This is the book to get. All right. And we're going to start at the highlighting, of course. Um, biblical references are found in various West African traditions as the formation of the blacksmith caste. All right. The formation of the blacksmith caste or the famous legend of Wagadu recorded by Charles Martel relating the foundation of the ancient kingdom of Uganda. This tradition tells that the founders of the kingdom was the chief of blacksmiths, all right? Who founded the kingdom of Ghana? Or Wagadu, the Mandi people. So the tradition tells that the founders of the kingdom was a chief blacksmith, Dinga, who descended from King Solomon. All right, so this is why I really say the, the Mandy people, they more than likely descend from Judah as well as Dan. Because they do have traditions that Dinga was from um, the line of Judah by way of King Solomon. But again, it says according to the tradition or the tradition, when Dinga became blind, it was transferring his power. He was trickled by his youngest son in the same way of that Isaac tricked um, Jacob to deprive Esau of his right of the eldest son. There are different narrations of who Dinga was, but invariably they established the fact that he was a stranger from afar, probably of white origin. All right. And um, don't, 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 don't um, let this hijack you peep the hijack, shoot me, spit out the bone. But the lengthy components of the story of the exile of the 10 trials are found in this myth. African scholars consider the legend of Wagadu as a con condensation of stories which serve as archives for the entire ethnic group. First, there is the long Suniki journey from Yemen or Palestine, then crossing um, North Africa through Egypt. All right, we just read about them being in elephant time, and what is um, persistently the desert of Adar and Tagnit, or Tagnit, and the settlements of the fertile northern region of Timbuktu. And it says it must be said that in this specific case of the Smiths or the blacksmith class, biblical traditions and possible Jewish influence have been um, interrelated to the point that in some regions of Mauritania, for instance, Smiths are called Yahu or Yibri or Yibro. All right. So we see the traditional blacksmith class amongst the Mandy people is actually biblical. And um, they brought this knowledge into Africa uh, when they migrated in, again, because not everybody knows how to do um, metalworking or blacksmithing. And this is stuff you have to learn from your ancestors. Um, and it's passed down generations and generations, all right? 
Um, you can't just wake up one day and say, um, I want to, um, I'm about to, um, you know, do start doing blacksmith because you have to learn this um technique. And again, we're about to wrap it up with this last source. And this last source is actually going to lead us into um the LDAD video later on dealing with where the Sabbat Yon is. But as we can see, um, this book is called Archives Moroccanese or Archive or Archives or Morocco. And as we can see, it's in French, but we're going to be dealing with this highlighted section. And you already know I was able to get it um translated. So we're going to look at the highlighted um translated part on this next slide. All right. And it says we must add to this. Well, we might as well just read from the very top down to the highlighted section. All right, we're going to read from the very top down to the highlighted section. It says, likewise, the ingenious way in which this establishes the real existence of Hebrew dialect, which differs from all the other in which it excludes to or at the same time any rabbinic and Karaite influence necessarily brings us back to only country where the language of the Bible still alive in one of his closest daughters, the African Phoenician, was able to find a last refuge that to say at the southeastern end of Africa, where Judeo Berbers and Libyo Phoenicians, repulsive by the Arab conquerors, have met for the last time. This dialect necessarily altered explains the strange form of certain words revealed by Eldad. This language, excuse me, that this language which had been spoken by the tribe of Dan, as well as the existence of the tribe itself, was not a thing of the past. It was excuse me, it's what two testimonies from the 10th century shows us that it says a century after the appearance of Eldad and which, excuse me, of which one speaks to us about the Danite Jews who came to Fiz or to Fiz from the desert, from a Jewish country and who spoke um, a peculiarly um, Hebrew. And if um, you know the story of Eldad, he was, he was actually, Excuse me, my mic meant muted. But as I was saying, if you um know the story of um Eldad, he was actually coming from Ghana when he went into um North Africa. When he was speaking about a Jewish community in the Sahara, he was talking about um these West African communities. But we're gonna get into that next video. But it says we must add to this information that Eldad the Danai had been accompanied in his travels by a desert Jew. All right, by a desert Jew who traces origin to the tribe of Asher, son of Jacob, or among the Mandi or Soniki tribes who trace their origins back to the chiefs of the tribes of Israel. We find also indeed by the name of Asher. But again, the source is indicating that the man that traveled with Eldad <laughs> was from the tribe of, was from um, the Mandi people or from the Soniki people. All right. Now, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. But again, before we wrap this up, I'm, I'm going to repeat it. Um, what, what we just went over within this source. But again, um, it is being proposed within this literature that the, the, the Jew or the man from the tribe of Asher that acquainted Eldad the Danite was actually a Mandy or rather from the Suniki people. So the question would be what tribe was Eldad from? All right, what tribe was Eldad from? Was he Ethiopian Jew like everybody like to say? All right, was or was he from West Africa? We shall see. And with that, that's the end of this lecture or lesson. All right, and if anybody has any questions, please leave them in the um, comment section. Any questions, concerns, um, anything, go ahead and leave it before we get ready and get out of here. And also, a brother wanted to know um, if the community of Israelites within Elephantine were Jews or I mean, were from the Southern Kingdom or Northern Kingdom. I'm going to show you real quick. Go back to the um, beginning of the presentation where we brought that out at. But 
it was a mixture of both. But again, right here, we're gonna. It's the second highlight of section. It says the fact that the religious practices in the in the Elephantine colony have a northern Israelite background means that the Jewish segment of the population is chronologically secondary. The Jewish character of the Elephantine colony is probably based on the importation or the important influx of Judites who joined the Israelite settlers. Right, the original Israelite settlers were the northern kingdom um, by way of the Assyrian exile. But it says it must be kept in mind, moreover, that the immigrants from the northern Israel would have entered Egypt by way of Judah. All right, so they would have went through um, Judah to get to Egypt. And it says it may be surmised that many of them had not intended to prolong their way um, or prolong their wandering all the way into Egypt. At any event, some of them stay in Judah for a significant length of time. All right. So again, this video was just to connect um, the Mandy people with the Elephantine Jewish diaspora. Uh, we see the connection, and um, I think it's, it's really telling in the names that they call themselves, again, because the Jews of Ghana and uh, Ghana and uh, Mali, Timbuktu, they were known as the Bani Israel, and the Ethiopian Jews are known as the Beta Israel. So, yes, yes, yes. Make sure um, you go back and catch the beginning so it can, you know, make total sense so you can understand um, where I'm coming from and, and where I'm saying. And even if you haven't checked out part one, um, go check out that as well. Brought out some good information on that. Um, so again, man, I hope everybody enjoyed their Shabbat today, man. Um, get in the scripture, fast, pray, do whatever you do. Continue to be obedient to the law, statutes, and commandments. All right. I thank you all for tuning in. And again, uh, most high willing, we'll be back again next Shabbat for some more information, for some more videos um, regarding the dispersed ones beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. And again, man, I'm going to continue to bring out this information because we always have those people who like to, you know, come in, come in under the videos, making it seem like you don't know what you're talking about, uh, making it seem like you just, you know, making stuff up out of your butt. When I'm actually reading, you know, from from scholarship, from authors, from scientists, from geneticists, from linguists, from historians, from anthropologists, you know, this isn't this isn't my work. Uh, this is scholars' work. So if you disagree with what I'm saying, you you should go, um, you know, go to that author, go write the author, go um, send him a re re redaction letter, something, you know. But again, I'm gonna keep stepping on the people's neck with the information. By the will of the Father, man. And again, I see no questions or comments or anything in the chat. But again, I thank you all for coming in today, and I'll see you all next weekend, man. Shabbat shalom. Will do, will do. Shabbat shalom. And actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave us out to a um, Mandinka um, art song. One of those Jewish um, musicians amongst the. The Mandinka people, all right. We go, we gonna rock after that. Just millions of promo codes and drop. Lang you to me get in thing, alo la da dong. Benga se de abo ni mu alo la da. La 
Nanyuruto minja tending Alola darong Ngasede ako nyemu Alola darong Wik ang Alola darong Ngasede ako nyemu Alola jirini Nanyuruto la kumbo Nimete balofa ngase de ako nimu alola jeng lanyuruto la wasio nimete balofa ngase de ako nimu alola jeridi wai an alola jerong ngase de ako nimu alola jeridi wai an alola jerong be ngase de ako nimu alola jeridi you want that? You want that? You need a new Alinga la juru tolu boya ngela nya todi la dunia kono ngase de ako nyemu alola kiri di la juru to menje tending alola kero mbe ngase de ako nyemu alola kiri di